Boston, the hub city of the old world. Welcome, and today our explorations take us to one of the oldest municipalities in the United States, Boston. Settled in 1630 by Puritan settlers from Boston, Lincolnshire in Great Britain, we're told that this is one of the most unique and culturally rich old areas in the United States. Several of our explorations we've been trotting around the United States and then other parts of the world, but I felt it fitting to come back and finish Boston because being one of the oldest municipalities, according to the official account, there are many intriguing aspects to explore. There's also one of the greatest building anomalies I think I've seen so far in these explorations. So let's take a close look at Boston and see what questions we can ask and what answers we can find. Thank you for joining me today. We have many old maps of Boston and we can see that it played a very significant role in the American revolutionary conflict against Great Britain. Boston was in fact the center of that conflict. Boston being located in Massachusetts off the Shawmut Peninsula. I've also heard it pronounced the Shamu Peninsula, although I think that was one of my colleagues just playing a joke on me. You might have noticed if you're a frequent viewer of this channel that I often poke fun at pronunciations, and the reason for that is many of the esteemed individuals I work with in academia who claim to have been from many of these areas oftentimes mispronounce the names themselves. So I don't know if I'm calling into question the veracity of their claims or what. But when you look at Boston, you can see that it looked a little different in this old map. And in this old map, they even tell us that it's not fully accurate. So let's take a look at the bird's eye view from the 1870s. And once again, we see a very well-developed city. And of course, it would make sense for Boston because it's been around since the 1630s. The Puritans were there first from Boston and Lincolnshire. There's also a great story of Robin of Sherwood concerning the Sheriff of Lincolnshire, but I digress. You see that there's many wonderful buildings and infrastructure that was already built out, including that wonderful obelisk that we'll take a look at. Yes, wondrous obelisks and, hmm, a very well laid out and complex grid pattern to this city. We also see that there are many maps of it from the 17th and 18th centuries that show that it appears to have been well developed and very well planned out. We also see a series of hills or what they would call mountains. We referred to how Boston was known for its role in the Revolutionary War, and there are many tales of the Battle of Bunker Hill, although it actually occurred on Baden Hill, and the Patriots, the proficiency of the American militia. When we look at this disposition of British forces, though, in Boston from that conflict time, the 1770s, we look and notice that there's an interesting structure here on Fort Hill, and we've seen these structures before, haven't we? And we've developed a new name for them on this channel. Fort Hill, our geometrically precise foundation structure, GPFS. I know, sometimes you have to have a little fun with the naming conventions on these things. A bastion fort, as they would call it at that time. Yet, looking at Fort Hill today, we see yet another one of these very unique and beautiful standpipe water towers. Now, when I first started these explorations, I did not think that these standpipe water towers were very common. And yet it seems as though every city I go to, especially in the United States, to do an exploration, there is a standpipe water tower. And I want to invite you all in the comments to tell me what you think these structures originally were or what they were for. We've seen them in St. Louis, where they're featured most prominently. We've seen them in Milwaukee in Wisconsin and even in Madison in Wisconsin. And of course, the very pretty one down in Louisville, Kentucky. And here we have one in Boston as well, along with a very unique structure next to it, and different pictures which seem to give a different indication as to how this structure was used and established. What was really the purpose behind these standpipe water towers? Many beautiful brick that went into the construction and elaborate knowledge of how to arrange brick at a high altitude, especially at that time when we're told that people couldn't really go very high or it was more difficult. I'm always impressed, though, by the arrangement of the bricks at the higher altitudes when they build these structures, and these standpipe water towers are a recurring theme with that. Perhaps the area that's most known in Boston, though, is Beacon Hill, which is the oldest portion of the complex downtown area. And in the interest of full disclosure, I am not from Boston. I've only been through there a few times in my life. And this goes way back in the day when I'll admit that I was a Celtics fan. And yes, I do remember how to park at Boston Garden without paying for parking. And I am aware of little details that 
Boston College is not actually in Boston. But do I know anybody named Sully? No, just Agent Scully from the X-Files. Looking at this old image, though, you can see that there were many hills and mountains in Boston. And once again, we have another one of these tales from the 1840s of this major excavation project. And they even say that when they cut down some of these mountains, and you can see how they did it with pickaxes and horses, they used it to reclaim the land. And this is Beacon Hill as it appears today. Very pretty, complex urban terrain, and yet at the same time, very well laid out. You'll also find a little bit of a settling image with Boston when you look at it. And yet, we also have some very old images of Boston from 1850 to 1910. And you may not be surprised to know that, once again, we also have another story of a fire. We'll get to that in a second. Let's look at some images, though. And I also know there's a difference between Fenway Park and the Fenway. So that's about the extent of my knowledge with Boston. But looking at some of these older images, along with the bird's eye view map, we once again get the impression that this was a very well-developed city a very long time ago. And when we question the narrative or the official historical account, as we call it on this channel, because that's what it is, it is technically the official historical account, we find once again that we pose many questions just by looking at the images. Because oftentimes the images that we look at, such as in this case, cause us to question what we're told in the official account. And here's the old Boston City Hall. And believe it or not, this one's still standing today, and we'll take a closer look at it. Still very impressive for 19th century architecture and achievements, even for a city that had been around. And looking at the foundations of this bridge, again, another 19th century photo, although looking at the photos themselves, you always get more questions and answers in terms of their quality. And there seems to be a lot of variety in the quality. Boston is well known as being settled by many Irish, and strangely enough, you don't really have any accounts of the Know Nothing Party, which was a political party that existed in the United States from 1850 to 1860, and then just seemed to magically go away once the United States Civil War started. But what's known about the Know Nothing Party is they didn't really care for all the immigrants that were coming into the United States at the time. There's also accounts of how Boston played a significant role in the Civil War. It's interesting when you look at how Boston played a role in the Revolutionary War and then it went away. Then they changed it from a town to a city. And there's really not much history until 1850 when they started playing their major role as an abolitionist city or a city that was against the role of slavery in the United States and wanted to put a stop to it. This is one of the older images of Boston, an aerial image from 1860, obviously taken from some sort of balloon. And once again, we see a very well-developed and complex urban terrain that's impressive for the 1860s. We also see other buildings that have all these little stylings and decorations that go within them. So not just the major municipal and religious buildings, but also many of the residential buildings. And many of these endure to this day. And just so you know, we'll be covering the uh, MIT in a future exploration, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. That's worthy of an exploration in and of itself. It should be noted, though, that Boston seems to be an area of learning and culture and development, and that's always been true, regardless of whether we go with the official account or just looking at what remains of the buildings there. There's always the reputation of how Boston was the foundational portion of the United States Civil War. This is an interesting home here that was supposedly a home for tuberculosis patients. I always find it interesting how they got an elaborate structure where they could recover and convalesce. Well, let's take a look at some images of the Boston Fire from 1872. The Boston Fire, once again, another one of these very crazy disasters that occurred in all these cities in the 19th century. And as part of our questions, we see that the fire seemed to have the ability to reduce many buildings to rubble. And not just large rubble, but also small rubble. I'm trying to figure out exactly what's going on in these images, and I certainly invite your comments. What do you think of this? We have very large brick buildings, stone buildings, and other construction materials, granite even, that we wouldn't think would be susceptible to fire. Although, it's intriguing when you try to ascertain what the burning temperature of fire is, and you'll get all kinds of different answers. You'll also get different answers in terms of what materials burn at what temperatures. But once again, we see these very unique diagonal cuts, and we also just see a lot of rubble within these fires. We're told that the Boston Fire was just as destructive as the Chicago Fire. But what's interesting, though, is that the Chicago Fire is stated to have destroyed the entire city of Chicago, and they simply had to rebuild it, <laughs> also in the same decade. Another coincidence, I'm sure. But you look at some of these structures, and you look at how they're rubbled, and they try to justify this. We did look at the Boston Fire in an earlier exploration on this channel when we were talking about the power of fire. It's interesting how fire can have a wide swath of destruction or it can be very specific, such as confined to a single building. 
But when you look at some of the images of this rubble, this is where you have to ask these questions because it causes you to consider what's really going on. If what you see with your eyes in the image doesn't match the official account, do you simply accept the official account or do you ask questions and look for answers? A lot of people will simply be satisfied with, well, I went to the museum and I saw these images and I have the official account and these images actually back up the official account. How exactly do you explain the details of this destruction? And they try to do it by saying that the Boston Fire Department was not prepared to handle this fire. They don't really give a good explanation for the cause of the fire, naturally. And then you have conflicting images such as this with the presence of the town militia or whatever military force was around at the time, standing and posing for a picture in front of buildings that were completely destroyed. Again, rubbling like this, you have to go to images of saturation bombing, as they called it, or carpet bombing from World War II to find anything that really compares. And yet, looking at the wider swaths of destruction, the images almost portray the story that Boston was completely leveled by this fire. But we'll see towards the end of this presentation that that's not what the official account tells us is the case. The other thing they'll try to also explain is that several aspects of the building were made of wood and were therefore susceptible to fire. But was wood holding up all this stone and what looks to be very advanced concrete at the time? And the fire caused the foundation structures of the wood to simply burn or melt? And then the buildings lost their structural integrity and all fell apart? Now in this image you do see some of the buildings that weren't damaged by the fire. Once again though, it's always the buildings in the background. So, a little bit of a conflicting account here. Was the whole city destroyed by fire, or wasn't it? Some of the destruction seems to be a lot more specific, too, which is interesting to consider because, like we said earlier, does fire destroy a wide swath, or is it confined to a certain area? Once again, this being 1870, you're still impressed by what remains of the buildings. And it's also interesting how these look familiar to photos of other destruction that we've seen in other cities across the United States, whether it was from the 19th century or the early 20th century. Look at this building here. It looks like we have almost cannonballs going through some of these holes here. But what really happened? Was this another example of a Union Army that made a wrong turn and decided to come north? I remember watching an old episode of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, and if you're not familiar with it, Dr. Quinn was from Boston, and I remember when she visited Boston, and I think it was set right around the 1870s, but no mention of this very destructive fire. This is supposedly a granite structure that was melted by the fire. And what kind of temperature of fire melts granite? Well, like I said, look it up and you'll get different answers. And then, of course, in this bird's eye view that someone did, we see that the destruction really didn't encompass most of the city. Now, I'm not diminishing or saying it's not terrible, but once again, it's a conflicting account. And it is just a painted picture. Well, let's take a look at Bunker Hill Monument, built 1825 to 1843. And this was that great obelisk that we saw in the bird's eye view earlier. Once again, another impressive obelisk that was built in the early to mid 19th century to commemorate the Battle of Bunker Hill, although it's actually sitting on Baden Hill, which was where the battle actually occurred. So why was it called Bunker Hill? Because supposedly that was the original objective of the British Army when they were trying to seize where the militia of Boston and Massachusetts had set up at the time. Quite a monument, and it should be noted it was completed well before the Washington Monument. Colonel William Prescott, the militia officer who was famous for saying, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. And I'll just relay to you, the first time I heard that was when I was watching a Bugs Bunny cartoon when he was going up against uh, Sam Von Spam, the Hessian. They also have a nice little structure that's built next to this obelisk. And of course, it's this old, uh, what we'd call a Roman Greco structure. Nice little pediment and columns. And while it may be smaller, it should be interesting to note that all the details of architecture are still present on it. So it wasn't enough that they built a gigantic obelisk as a memorial to the Battle of Bunker Hill on Baden Hill. They also built this uh, little structure to commemorate it as well. And it's no less impressive because you even have the door decorations and all the little trimmings that we've come to expect on pediments and columns that we see in all these explorations. I'm surprised we didn't get some story about how they moved this obelisk from someplace in Egypt or even Rome you know, block by block and reestablished it in the United States because apparently that was an easy thing to do back then, you know. Here's our construction drawing that we have of the obelisk, very convincing because photography hadn't been invented or so we're told at the time this incredible obelisk was constructed. And when you look at it from different images, you can also get a feeling for some of the older bu buildings that still exist in this portion of Boston around this obelisk. And you can see that it was made of very intricate blocks. 
And it's also part of many beautiful vistas as to where you can get an idea of some of the wondrous culture that still survives in Boston. It is a very pretty city to visit, and it's certainly one I would like to go see again. And what obelisk would be complete without a spiral stairway within it? Because it's not impressive enough that they built the obelisk in 1825 to 1843. Why not just put a staircase in it so you could go to the top of it? I mean, what's the point of having a tall obelisk like this unless you can actually go into it and walk to the top? Long before anybody was thinking about that arch in St. Louis that wouldn't be built till the 20th century. I think this is just a little more impressive. And I only say that because of the time frame that it was supposedly done. If, of course, we accept the official historical account without question. Which you're more than welcome to do. And do so at your own discretion. Now let's look at the Boston Garden, built 1928 and 11 months and demolished in 1995. I did not cover this during the stadium exploration because I wanted to cover this with Boston, and I'd been looking to do an exploration of Boston for some time. The Boston Garden is an impressive Art Deco building, and yes, I've been to this building before it was unfortunately demolished in the 1990s to watch many Boston Celtics games. Yes, a Midwest person who was quite a fan of the Boston Celtics. Look, in the 1980s, you went one of two ways. You were either a Celtics fan or you were a Lakers fan. And it was interesting in my family. My father and I were Celtics fans, and my brother was a Lakers fan. So, yeah, interesting times in the 80s. Unfortunately, they demolished this building, and this was quite a tragic loss. And there was a lot of controversy about it, supposedly, in Boston at the time. No, I wasn't there when they tore it down, but I certainly saw the articles. And given the history behind this building and the rich history, even the sports history, if you look at from the Boston Celtics and the hockey team, I don't really follow hockey in interest of full disclosure, but it's, it's very sad to see that a wonderful Art Deco building like this was torn down. And the reason we're given is because it was old, it didn't have air conditioning, and it was very uncomfortable with the seating. The usual reasons that were given. Well, let's look at Fenway Park, built in 1912. Now, this also goes back to the stadium explorations, and Fenway Park is the oldest active Major League ballpark, and there's quite a storied history with the Boston Red Sox. And of course, many people will be telling me, yes, and Boston is known for being the home of Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. And that's true. In just about every Ben Affleck movie you watch, it's contemporary. You'll see a reference to the Red Sox, even in the science fiction movie Paycheck. Very impressive, though, with uh, Fenway Park here. And you see something that seems as though there's a different story behind it, especially when you look at the front facade and the entryway to this stadium. And it has a rich and storied history. And I am impressed by the fact that it has survived this long. And even in some of the seating here, you get the hint of a different kind of architectural styling done at the very early 20th century. The layout is also interesting, and they'll tell you to this day, it's a little bit more difficult to get to Fenway Park, and this just shows you how it sits in the current city of Boston with the complex urban terrain. Again, another one of these signs that we see with uh, these old world cities, as we call them when we look at them. Very beautiful park, and I'm glad that this is something that still survives because this is something you can visit to this day and get an idea of how something was supposedly constructed in the early 20th century. Now, was it? I'm not sure. However, it is another example of something that you can evaluate for yourself. Now let's go to the Boston Custom House, built in 1849. The most amazing building ever. And why am I saying this is the most amazing building ever? Well, just stay with me for a moment. Yes, it's our classic Roman Greco building that has a dome, a pediment, and columns. But being built in 1849 was very impressive, supposedly authorized by President Jackson himself in the 1830s when he was still president and then built a little while later. And we have another one of these uh, one-dimensional perceptions, a <laughs> side cutaway of this incredible edifice. But what exactly makes this edifice so incredible, you're probably asking. Well, being built in 1849 and putting this kind of effort into a custom house is interesting because what's a custom house really supposed to do? Really just inspect the imports into the harbor and of course we'll have some taxation purposes associated with it. It's still an impressive smaller building but the official account with it is it was something that they needed in Boston, and of course they had to put a little dome on top of it. Okay, so we've got a little dome, we've got a little building, we've got a very well-documented history with many images, and you're asking, okay, Aurelian, what's so incredible about this building? We've seen many others like it. Well, it was designed by Ami B. Young, a prescient genius. Was he a divine architect? Now, why was I saying this? Because he laid out and designed this building after winning a competition, of course, in the 1840s, and then they built it in 1849. All right, yes, we've seen other buildings that were built at this time, such as the courthouse in St. Louis. What exactly is so special about this one? Well, 
They added a tower to it. Peabody and Stearns added the tower. Building height was moved up to 496 feet, and it was the tallest building in Boston until 1964. Now consider this. They added a tower, and this wasn't a tower that was light made out of our modern steel and glass and plastic as we like to build skyscrapers out of now. Oh no, this was a fully well-constructed tower that increased the height of the original custom house building by a factor of four or five. And you can do the exact math on it, but when you look at it, you also see the extraordinary achievement that the tower itself is almost as wide as the original base building. So how exactly did Ami B. Young know to architect and design a building that was able to support a weight of a tower that they added to it that was five times the height of the original building, or more? And we can see that this is all very solid construction and done in the early 20th century, and here you can see the tower on top of the original structure. I think that's just astounding that the original structure was standing for over 60 years when they added that tower to it. And it really does show that Ami B. Young was some sort of extraordinary genius. Or perhaps he was prescient, I'm not sure which. Now you might be saying, okay, well we saw this example with the Singer Building in New York City, and that's true. But the Singer Building had a much wider base. And the tower didn't basically take up the entire base. Now we have construction photos. <laughs> and of course we have our usual authentic construction photos, which I'm sure will be enough to satisfy the curiosity of many people. So did they have to redo the roof of the original custom house? Did they have to remove the dome? There's very little in the official account as to how and why they added this great tower to it. Why not just build a new building? And it seems that like many of these other wondrous buildings from the late 19th, early 20th century, we have a model, which of course doesn't even compare with the real thing in terms of visual appearance. Looking at the clock, though, we also have an account that the clock itself didn't run because uh, apparently it was not built to specification. And interesting that it has Arabic numerals and not Roman numerals on it, as we usually see with these older clocks. This is now a hotel. I believe it was a Hyatt, and shooting from the hip here, if not a Marriott. And look at some of the incredible interiors with this building. And keep in mind, this is in the tower right here, and this is supposedly made of all marble. Now, I haven't visited this building in person. I'm certainly going to have to and verify this. And also remember that this is built on top of a custom house that had been standing for 60 years until they added all of this in the tower. I think this is one of the most impressive architectural achievements. And if the official account is true, then it's clear we could construct buildings that could stand up to any kind of natural disaster and hold a very large tower that increased the height of the building by a factor of five for over a hundred years. I find that rather a stunning achievement. And you can see that the custom house, once the tower was added, was one of the most prominent features on the Boston skyline. Indeed, many would say it was the first skyscraper, skyscraper within Boston. Very impressive. Well, let's take a look at the old city hall, built 1862 to 1865. So just because there was a little civil war going on doesn't mean that Boston wasn't going to build the most incredible imperial empire, second empire structure city hall. Ah, uh, yes, here's the current city hall in Boston, built in 1968. Our finest brutalist architecture. I wonder if someone's going to be uh, leading Alex in a clockwork orange out of that building. That's what it reminds me of. But going back to the pretty old city hall, we see once again the wonder, wonders of an architectural design from the 1860s. Now, I'm not going to tell you to think which one's prettier or which one you prefer. And by all means, if you want to tell me you prefer the modern brutalist architecture, let me know. Please tell me why in the comments. I'm interested to hear. But in this old city hall, we see the usual columns and pillars that are integrated into the wall in a very pretty design. Not just with the base, but also going up to the roof. Once again, as though no aesthetic was spared. And of course, these are the kind of things that you need to have in a city hall. And we're quite used to seeing these sort of aspects in these buildings now. But no matter how many times we see them, and the whole point of looking in all these explorations is to see just how commonplace this all truly is. Not just in the United States, but across all the land. Because I think that these achievements, whenever they occurred, are extraordinary to this day. And the interior of the old city hall is no less impressive. Of course, you have columns on the inside, very large doors, and very open cavern areas. This almost kind of reminds me of some of the courthouses that I looked at uh, from Iowa in the 19th century when you have some of the columns integrated next to the stairway, such as pictured here. And once again, more columns on top of a banister. And again, no detail spared. You can even see it in the ceiling, and you can see it in the banister as well. The nice thing is the old city hall is preserved in Boston, and you can see it to this day. 
ah, rather like that symbol representing Boston in terms of being a hub city. Now, there's conflicting accounts for why they call it a hub city, originally being one of the major cities that was immigrated to by the Irish, and there's quite the reputation of the Irish being in Boston, as any Matt Damon movie from the 1990s will remind you of. I still find these images very intriguing, though, and how they portray Boston as being that hub city. Let's take a look at Symphony Hall, Boston. This was built in 1900 after 16 months. And again, we see the same thing. We have a pediment and columns because we were favoring that in the early 20th century, especially in a place like Boston. Symphony Hall is very impressive, though, because you'll see some of that architectural styling with some of the arches and decorative detailings that go into it. And keep in mind, while Boston was around since the 17th century, most of these architectural achievements were done in the 19th or the early 20th century. That seems to be a recurring theme that we have with the official account. Once again, I'm glad to see that a building like this survives to this day, and there's something even more impressive about it once we look at the inside. Why is it we don't put this kind of effort into our arts and entertainment today? Because that's what this building was constructed for. It's just like all these opera houses that we had all over the place. Well, this was Boston's version of it. And strangely enough, you'll find opera houses in every small town across the entire United States. Even the small town in Manterville, Minnesota, which population doesn't even really exceed 1,000 by that much. They have an opera house there, and it's made out of that uh, wonderful limestone-sandstone mix that they just have there. Looking at the interior, though, you can see no decorative detail left untouched. And even looking at old pictures of previous performances, you have questionable things that occurred within the symphony hall. Were these true or were these just some artist imagination? I'm not really sure. But you can still visit the symphony hall to this day and watch live performances. And I even had a colleague that had been there many times and oftentimes spoke of the beauty on the interior of the building. And I can see why. I certainly don't dispute that. Looking at the balconies and even the decorative detailing around the stage... And it seems as though, once again, no detail left untouched, and it really sparks your imagination just looking at this. Well, let's look at the Boston Public Library. This is the McKim Building in 1895. Now, it should be noted that Boston was known for having one of the first major public libraries in the United States, and this was the newer one that they built in 1895. So, another late 19th century building. And we can see that, once again, they didn't spare any of the detail in the construction when they were putting it all up. Apparently it was just so easy to do in the 19th century. And I know you keep saying that after a while, but you have to consider the fact that why aren't we building buildings like this today? Well, because it's just too expensive and because we just, well, we'll say it, we, we don't have the will to do it. There's too much government regulation, especially in the United States. Yes, government regulation. The answer for why we can do anything when it comes to conflict, but why we can do nothing when it comes to architectural achievement. The layout of the building is intriguing, too, from the aerial perspective, because it gives the square layout as well. You also see some of the old statues. And, of course, here, what's really going on with the statue? I know they'll say it's a statue of science or statue of art or something along those lines, but it seems to paint a different picture. We also have a picture of our cornerstone lane ceremony, and that's oftentimes good enough for people. Well, they did the cornerstone lane ceremony, and it means we really built this building in the late 19th century. Why don't we do cornerstone lane ceremonies anymore? Well, I guess you'd call it a girder lane ceremony, or maybe a plastic ceremony. We have construction photos, and again, there's no problem with these construction photos, and I'm certainly not going to tell you what to think. But yeah, I'm, I guess I'm convinced that they built this library, if you just believe these photos. Oh, uh, yes, another one. It's always amazing to me, though, the curious lack of activity, but I'm sure they just always came and shot these photos when it was a break day, especially when you look at the construction timelines on many of these buildings. I haven't really covered libraries as much in some of the other explorations, and given the reputation that Boston had with its library, I felt it fitting to include it in this exploration. One of the things I try to do is I try to cover different types of buildings in each of the cities because there's a reason why the city is known for that building, and I think that's one aspect in the official account that's still gleans truth from whatever the original truth actually was. The entryway to this library is truly astounding. And when you look at some of the beauty and the detail that goes into it, and of course we have our friendly lions guarding the door again because, you know, lions are just really awesome. MGM thinks so too. It also has a courtyard in the back of the library with the arches and the columns. And th this just gives a reflection of one of these courtyards that you would expect to have a great time. And you can see why they would host weddings there. And remember what we said about weddings. You always know you're going to have a successful, long-lasting wedding <laughs> if you get married in an old world building. Well, you can guarantee it's not going to last if you got, say, married at the current Boston City Hall. Your marriage would probably be over in about five to six months. Still, it's not easy to imagine why some would have that fairy tale image and getting married at the Boston Library. 
Looking at the main hall though, this is just extraordinary when you look at how the layout of the ceiling is and all the decorative detailing in it, and you even have a little balcony over there. <sighs> you know, sometimes you just get swept away when you look at the interiors of some of these buildings, and it amazes me how people can just pass through this every day, but you know, I'm not judging anybody because that's what we're conditioned to do. We're conditioned to just walk right in and out of this every day and not really think twice of it. Now, there may be some people that can appreciate some of the artistic appeal in it, but when you really start to step back and look at it and appreciate it for what it is, you can't help but just be completely blown away for how they achieve this. And of course, you're not going to see any construction photos of erecting a single pillar or a column, or especially the ceiling here in this library, because why would anybody want to see that? That's just boring stuff. You know, just take pictures, just showing some very generic things, and bam, construction photo done, and I'm satisfied. And you may be too, and that's okay if you are. I'm still going to appreciate the building for what it is. Well, let's take a look at the Massachusetts State House, built in 1798. And this is an example of so-called federal architecture. Yes, we have another architectural type. And frequent viewer of the channels know that I'm a sucker for state capitals. And this is one of the oldest ones in the United States. And certainly preceded the Capitol in Washington, D.C. and most of the other state capitals. There's a lot of conflicting accounts with this, and we'll see that this state capital in Massachusetts is the victim of constant renovation. Why would you need to do any kind of renovation on a building such as this? And I always find these accounts for why we need to do renovation very conflicted and confusing, as they're no doubt intended to be. Look at the windows and the columns there. And once again, we'll see that while it may seem to be a somewhat more modest state capital, once again, once you look in the interior, you find that that is not the case at all. You will see all the stunning architectural achievements of how they lay out, for example, this balcony and this rotunda here. And I mean, look at the ceiling up there. And then, of course, all the columns. And naturally, there'll be no pictures of the construction of erecting any columns. And also look uh, closely at the gold dome here. Going back to the notion of lacking of pictures of columns, I think the only picture I've seen of building a column was that one from the, I think it was the Civil Courts building in St. Louis, where we saw that gentleman with a very precarious toehold as he was dangling hundreds of feet in the sky as a crane lifted the top of a column in place, supposedly. Once again, more columns on the inside of this state house, the state capitol. And of course, we see our familiar floor pattern because, you know, maybe everybody just likes to play checkers or chess on the floor. <laughs> Look, sometimes you have to have a little fun with these explorations. There's other older photos of the state house, and it certainly gives a different idea of what the original layout was. We're even told that the original copper dome on the Massachusetts state house was provided by a company from Paul Revere of Paul Revere's fame. And it's also interesting to note that supposedly it was one of the churches that he stood up on a balcony when he saw the British were coming and then began his famous ride. Oh yes, this photo again. I'm always impressed by how they were able to do this stunning excavation of moving hills and mountains before we even had photography, and it was just that easy to do. I wonder what happened to that uh, column or obelisk up there. A couple images of these Mount Vernon churches because we're going to conclude with looking at uh, one of the more extraordinary churches that I've seen. And we have looked at a lot of extraordinary churches, cathedrals, and basilica, especially with Vatican earlier in this week. But Boston is known for its many different churches, and you would think that there would be a very strong Catholic presence in Boston because Irish are always associated with Catholics. At least that's what the Know Nothing Party used to say. But now we'll look at the First Church of Christ, the Scientist, built 1904 to 1906. Now it should be noted that this is the extension. And Christ the Scientist, another religion that just seemed to come up in the 19th century. And I always found that account very interesting because we're known of the tolerance of Americans in the 19th century. <laughs> of course, we're always told that's not the case, but you know, some people are tolerant, some people weren't. Perhaps that's the greatest truth of all. Another stunning religious edifice and a religion that cropped up in the 19th century, and they managed to build this. Now, oddly enough, the one of the first buildings of this religion that I looked up was actually in Wisconsin, although it really just looks like an old world house. It's interesting to note that there are several buildings on this entire compound, and they've really built this compound out. They have an original church that was built in the 1890s, and then they had this extension that they built in the early 20th century. And you'll see that these aren't just postcards or painted pictures. These are real images, and this is a building you can still go and visit to this day, which I think is very impressive. There's even one of these churches in Minnesota. And this, for some reason, reminds me of uh, the church from... Prince of Darkness, the John Carpenter film that we looked at about a month or so ago. This is stunning, though, looking at this extension, because this reminds me of the greatest basilicas that you see, and you can see the original church right there in front of it, and then, of course, we mix in some brutalist architecture on the right. 
and that just gives you a good contrast for how you can tell the differences. The interior of this church extension is stunning with a very large arch and domes and then of course we see the same details in the ceiling. And so different religions for different purposes, building different buildings, but yet the buildings having many of the same architectural stylings. And of course the answer will be because all the architects worked together, they corresponded very well, and they all had the same know-how, and they all had the same financial resources. Yes, there is a lot of great decorative and gorgeous architecture that accompanies this church. And this is something else, another religion that started in the 19th century, able to achieve these stunning architectural achievements. And here you see the extension, which is on the left, and the original church, which is on the right. Again, another series of buildings that I would love to visit in person, and Boston is on my list. I haven't been there since. <laughs> we won't say when the last time I was in Boston. It might give you a little too much information. But this is the original edifice that was built in the 1890s, and once again, we see a very stunning church made out of stone. And then looking at the overall extension, I just find it comical how they call that the extension. What's really going on there when you have what looks to be a mighty basilica from the Byzantine era? And then, of course, this is the rest of that entire compound, and they've added some lovely brutalist architecture buildings to it. Yes, is there really any comparison to it? And like I said, I'm fully accepting if you support brutalist architecture. So we go back to the tower, the custom house, the tower added to a building that was not designed for it. It means either the building was built with the tower originally, or this building is of a technology that is diminished. Really think about this. Think about what this custom house tower tells us. We could build a building that we could add a tower to that increased the height by a factor of five, a factor of six. Would you do that to a building today? What do you think about this? Let me know in the comments. And I don't want to try to direct you too much. And just a reminder for frequent viewers and fans of the channel, we do have a live stream this Saturday, so join us. We're going to be discussing resets, and would love to see you there, so please set that reminder. Well, thank you for joining me today. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Symbology? Now that Duffy has relinquished his king bonehead crown, I see we have an heir to the throne. I'm sure the word you were looking for was symbolism. What is the symbolism there? Aaron, the boatman who ferried you across to the gates of judgment, this made sure the dead came to atone for what they did during their lives, Detective Dallapapascalius. Jesus, you're the first one that ever got that. Yeah, well, I'm an expert in naniology. And we got two bodies in the morgue that look like they've been serial crushed by some huge friggin' guy.